and thank you to everybody for joining for this closing plenary for uh, the first online CBA conference, CBA 14. We uh, have lots uh, to talk about today. Uh, we will be uh, announcing the winners of the Dragon's Den competition and the film competition, and we'll be putting together all of the messages that have come out of some incredibly rich discussions that have taken place over the last few days. So without further ado, I think we are going to get on with uh, uh, the proceedings. So we're going to start today with a uh, pre-recorded video from Lord Zach Goldsmith, Minister of State for the Pacific and the Environment, who wanted to share uh, a pre-recorded message with all of the participants at CBA 14. Though I can't join you live today, it is a pleasure to be speaking to you. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for the fantastic work that you do and for what I'm sure have been productive conversations over the last few days. It's more than likely that the current pandemic, like so many before it, has resulted from our mistreatment and mismanagement of nature. It's caused misery for millions and economic disruption in every country. But the science is clear that if we continue to mistreat and abuse the natural world, the consequences will be far worse. And so we should certainly view it as a wake up call. And we know that even if we manage to get to grips with cutting our carbon emissions, disruptive change is inevitable. Even with one and a half degrees, for instance, we still risk losing between 70 and 90% of our coral reefs, on which a quarter of marine species and 500 million people depend for everything from food to coastal protection. And as we destabilize the climate, we're also fatally undermining Earth's natural systems. More than half of the world's agricultural land is now degraded and diminishing yields uh, will hit 500 million small farms the hardest. By the time I finish speaking to you today, we'll have lost the equivalent of 150 football pitches worth of forest. Now those forests are home to 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity. They regulate our water and climate systems and they underpin the livelihoods of over a billion people. Now today, governments everywhere are mapping out their plans for economic recovery from the pandemic and trillions of dollars have been identified for the task and that means that we have an opportunity if we choose wisely we can deploy those funds in a way that helps us transition to a cleaner more efficient system one way where we're able to live within nature's means and we can build on the vital adaptation work that you are all doing there are so many inspiring examples of work already underway around the world this week, we were pleased to be able to host a session with the International Institute of Environment and Development alongside the United Nations Development Programme. And we were able to learn from the Indian experience of integrating climate planning into their largest safety net programme to protect the poorest families from extreme poverty or destitution. Now, your expertise is central because it's based on a direct experience of what works. As COP26 presidents, we want to amplify your voices so that your experience can inform, inspire and stimulate effective adaptation and resilience at scale. It's why the UK supports the LDC group-led Life AR initiative and we encourage others to do so too, so that LDCs can take long-term action to help affected communities take control of building adaptation and resilience. By working together, we can help the world to adapt and protect lives and livelihoods from the effects of climate change. And we'll be encouraging countries to take as inclusive an approach as possible to developing and delivering their NDCs, adaptation plans and long-term strategies. And finally, we know that there is no pathway to net zero emissions without a major effort to protect and restore nature. We know that nature-based solutions could provide around a third of the most cost-effective climate change mitigation that we need by 2030, while also helping to reverse biodiversity loss and help people adapt to the changes that are happening. The fact that they attract just 3% of global climate investment makes absolutely no sense at all. So we're urging governments to step up. 
Last year, our own Prime Minister committed to doubling our international climate finance and to allocating a large proportion of it to nature-based solutions. And we're asking other countries to do similar. As COP26 presidents, we're asking governments to make sure that the nationally determined contributions that they bring to Glasgow next year are genuinely ambitious on mitigation and on adaptation and resilience. We need a clean energy, zero emission vehicles and green finance revolution. And we need the world to match their commitments to protect and restore nature with the scale of the crisis. And we hope you will join us. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. That's great. That was Zach Goldsmith, uh, Minister of State for Environment and the Pacific and one of the COP part of the UK ministers in the COP26 leadership team. And I want to extend a thank you uh, for recording that message in advance and recognising the role and expertise that this community can offer uh, in shaping uh, 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 future policy. So we're going to go straight on now to uh, a video from the chair of the LDC group, who has also uh, uh, recorded a video based on some of the key messages that have emerged uh, from this week. Excellencies, distinguished participants and friends, greetings to you all and welcome from wherever you're connecting around the world. Thank you for participating in the 14th International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation to Climate Change, the first to take place entirely online. Bhutan, in our capacity as the chair of the Least Developed Countries Group, is honored to host the final closing plenary session. During the last three days, we have seen over 400 people take part in over, from over 30 countries in over 30 different uh, dialogues and capacity building sessions. They have exchanged hundreds of written messages about the central challenges of community-based adaptation. We have heard speakers from over 30 countries share their perspectives, representatives of community-based organizations, shared the floor with national government policymakers, academy, academics, and development partners. It is also important that messages coming out of the discussions at this conference are heard and recognized at the highest levels. These messages represent the perspectives of the people working to build resilience every day and communities at greatest risk of climate change impacts, but who have done the least to cause the problem. The conference's response policy team highlighted the role of grassroots movements and organizations in bringing local knowledge into policymaking process and the positive impact inclusivity can have. Their responses to COVID-19 demonstrate how resourceful communities can be and how much we can learn from them. Local resourcefulness is exactly why we need to scale up climate finance significantly, finding the institutions in each country who truly understand local contexts and communities while having the capacity to deliver funds towards local priorities. At CBA 14, we also heard the challenges faced by young people and the need for greater youth inclusion in decision making from local right through to international level. We welcome the establishment of a youth adaptation network by the Global Commission for Adaptation during this conference. I was also greatly encouraged to see the issues of gender and monitoring, evaluation and learning repeatedly raised and discussed. It is clear that more work is needed to ensure that we can evaluate and learn from our collective climate adaptation experiences. During a session led by partners of LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, the challenge of establishing deep international networks for learning from adaptation programs were made clear. The least developed countries group will endeavor to use Life AR to lead the way in creating South-South learning networks that can make our path to resilient economies by 2050 smoother. In closing, I would like to thank the partners 
who have made this online CBA 14 possible. I appreciate the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, the Global Resilience Partnership, CARE International, Practical Action, the International Institute for Environment and Development, BRAC International, and the Global Commission on Adaptation. We call on development partners and contributors, as well as our colleagues across the least developed country to fully engage with the energy, vision, and ideas of this vibrant community of practice. We hope that CBA can trigger widespread engagement and productive partnership across the whole of society so that we can create a prosperous and socially just future for all. Between now and COP26, there are several events taking place, including the Global Adaptation Summit, Gobi Shona Online, and CBA 15 in Bangladesh. These events will offer the chance to continue the conversation we began here and for development partners to engage closely with the communities and their representatives. We look forward to seeing and working with you all over the year ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much to the LDC Chair for that video and to the Government of Bhutan for hosting uh, this online CBA. <clears throat> I also just wanted to pick up that the message was recorded earlier on and since then we've now had 8,000 written messages exchanged on the community board and participants from uh, 70 countries, not 30. So it's been uh, even bigger and more expansive than, uh, uh, than at the time of the recording of the video. So thank you for that. I'm going to hand over now to Salim Hook, who will be the master of ceremonies for the rest of this session. Salim is the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Over to you, Salim. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody from all over the world. I see we've got uh, well over 100 participants uh, with us today. Uh, we're looking forward to a very uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, important and, and informative uh, feedback session and then also a planning session going forward. Uh, the format of this session is going to be, we have three very distinguished panelists and we'll start with them. And then we will have a feedback on the overall uh, outputs of the various sessions that we had. And we'll also have a discussion on Mentimeter to get some feedback from all of our participants um, and then we have a very distinguished uh, representative from the UK government, uh, uh, Ambassador Paul Arkwright, who is the UK uh, government COP26 ambassador for Sub-Saharan Africa. And then before we end, we also have uh, the prize for the Dragon's Den uh, um, initiative that, to that took place during the conference, and we'll have the winner for that. And we'll also have a winner of the video competition that took place. So quite a lot to pack in. But let me start with our three very distinguished panelists. Uh, the first one is Claire Shakya, who is the head of the climate uh, change group in IID, the International Institute for Environment and Development, who are the organizers of this conference, um, the 14th uh, CBA conference. In the past, these all used to be uh, physical conferences with people present, and I've been to all, all 14 of them, but this is the first uh, online one that we've uh, had. And so, and a great, uh, uh, I think, kudos for all our colleagues in IID uh, for pulling it off very, very well. Uh, so uh, I, I'll ask her to uh, give some reflections. The second uh, panelist is David uh, Silakan, who is from Paran Alliance in Kenya. It's an alliance of uh, uh, advocates for uh, pastoralists in northern Kenya. Uh, we'll hear from him. And then the third and final panelist is Ms. Runa Khan, who is uh, uh, runs a, an NGO in Bangladesh called Friendship, which is uh, has been working for 20 years with vulnerable communities in very vulnerable parts of the country, which also now happen to be very climate vulnerable. And so they are now working on adaptation to climate change very much at the community level. So I have in this round, in the first round, I'm going to ask them two questions and I'll ask them uh, to answer the first one first, and then I'll come back to them. And if, uh, if you can keep your uh, uh, initial comments uh, within a, a couple of minutes, that would be good. Uh, the first question to Claire is, again, uh, it, and to all three of you, but to, starting with Claire, um, given 
uh, the role of, of the work that you do, and you can describe that a little bit if you like, um, what were, from your point of view, the major uh, outcomes of, uh, or the highlights of CBA 14 uh, that you were able to participate in, and, and your colleagues as well from IID, if you have any reflections from their side. Claire, would you like to take the floor? Thanks, Salim. Um, well, in this strange year where we've um, all been based from home for most of it, um, I was really hoping that CBA would inspire me with stories of action and influence, and I certainly felt that um, that was achieved. In um, IID, the Climate Change Group are working with the LDC Group in the climate negotiations, as well as in their long-term initiatives, um, as, as indeed Salim is, and the um, LUC, the LDC University Consortium for Climate Change, um, building capabilities within um, the LDC countries and on the effective adaptation, life they are. Um, and we also work on more broadly on climate governance and climate finance challenges and building partnerships that, that engage and amplify the voices of those who are often excluded. And what's so wonderful about CBA is it brings that community together, the, the range of partners that we work with, um, who are all really championing responses to multi-dimensional challenges. And we heard so many stories of how the grassroots, women and youth particularly, are championing collective and holistic responses and influencing their national governments, their, their donors, the international community more widely. Um, two of the things that really sort of has resonated and, and are staying with me, the inclusion, first, the inclusion is essential at every step. It requires effort and it requires dedicated resources to get beyond that tokenistic um, participation that we hear so much of. For CBA itself, we really saw that this year with youth and the grassroots organizations leading more session development than ever before and really challenging us and improving our focus on inclusion across all the sessions. Um, this sense of the, there's a real value of multi, multiple perspectives on wicked problems. Um, but that these different stakeholders, um, grassroots communities, actors at different levels are all bringing different, these different perspectives, but they're also bringing very different resources and connections. And if we're going to get this sort of distributed innovation for really transformational change, we need to keep working on that inclusion. And then the second was around um, partnerships, not, not beneficiaries of support or, or beneficiaries of capacity building. Um, and CBA again embodied this for me by inviting us all to contribute sessions, to share skills and ideas and opportunities like the Dragon's Den to really think through um, over a number of days how to pitch something, I thought was, was really exciting. And this, it came across again and again, and it's come up in previous CBAs that you know, local actors are the knowledge holders and are very creative in developing new types of solutions. But I guess what we got deeper into is how to build those radical collaborative partnerships that can disrupt power dynamics. And that real sense of aggregation, that, that we get power in numbers and we can be more influential. And I guess for me, CBA was a real opportunity to get a sense of how we've all learned over the last year, how we've responded to um, COVID-19 and how, how similarly the issues of responding to COVID-19 resonate with responding to climate change. Thanks, Great. Salim. Thank, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, excellent set of uh, outcomes. And I, I, I agree with you. The, the online nature of the event, I don't think uh, uh, was that big a barrier to participation, I, I felt, in, in the sessions that I was uh, part of. And I agree with you there. So let me now move on to David uh, Selakan from Kenya. David, would you like to uh, share your thoughts in terms of what the highlights of the conference were? And maybe if you could keep it within two to three minutes max. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever we are. Um, my name is David Silakan, Coordinating Partner Alliance, which is a network of more than 23 CSOs in Northern Kenya. And we are looking at building social movements around common issues, common solutions that are homegrown. In doing so, we engage with different user groups, the forest communities, we work with the water resource users communities, we work with the youth, we work with women, we work with the informal and informal institutions like the Council of Elders, the regional users, and also the 
fisher folks, hunter gatherers. So we have a, a good mix of CSOs where we are looking at how we can create movements from the smallest unit of the society to the top limb of the society where we can influence decision making, influence policy, create innovative indigenous knowledge, uh, best tested practices to build on resilience of our communities and also to look at the security and secure tenure of our land, which has been now the target of investments, the target of uh, extractive industries, which are also a hazardous to climate resilience and which affect the people's livelihoods, economies. And what we are dealing now is how we are going to reduce the carbon emissions. So in this regard, Parana lands in its structures works to focus on three things, amplifying the voices of the grassroots, indigenous people, securing their land tenure, and mobilizing resources and influencing policy to access resources so that they can do this. COVID pandemic has just came as an opportunity whereby the recognition of the grassroots communities self-organizing in addressing this pandemic, creating awareness, solidarity has already given us a chance to see that grassroots can offer solutions that can lead to global, uh, um, global reduction of pandemics. So in this CBA, my message is, if the governments committed themselves to giving multiple resources, multi-billion dollars to address COVID-19, which is just an last year's pandemic, which is not even one year old, and we have climate change that has been with us for several years, can we have that commitment and that robust way of making that commitment being a fruitful thing for the next COP? As they come to the next COP, let them make that commitment, a robust commitment that includes the youth, that includes the grassroots and making accessible the funding so that the grassroots can also respond with their own initiatives the way they have responded to COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. That was excellent. And I think the point about tying it to the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly the, uh, the investments that are going into the, uh, the new normal, as it were, I think is a very key element in terms of rethinking uh, the business as usual and trying to get out of some of the problems that we had in the past. So let me now move to our third uh, panelist, uh, um, who is uh, Runa Khan from uh, Friendship in Bangladesh. Runa, I know you and your colleagues uh, have, are participating in a CBA conference for the first time. So I'd be interested in getting your impressions on what your experience has been uh, in this particular conference. Runa, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Salim. Um, so I would like to first congratulate you on uh, IIED and all of you, you know, who have been and uh, uh, who have enabled this platform to take place CBA online. Because it's not only that uh, you know online conferences are going on, the quality of the con uh, in, and they're all happening and they're happening well, but the quality and the organization of this conference with over 550 participants have been incredible. So firstly, my congratulations to all of you. Um, because you have, through this conference, brought about possibly what is the biggest challenge, as you have mentioned, of humanity today, which is climate change and biodiversity loss. And this, I think all of us, every day that we have listened to the conference, this has come out more and more. And uh, this has been so linked to the present crisis that that oneness and togetherness of everyone understanding and being for the first time perhaps on the same platform of having a crisis at their doorstep, I think has also you know, strengthened the understanding of this conference. So I'm Runa Khan and uh, 20 years ago, I uh, started working in the most climate impacted regions of Bangladesh. Uh, we did not realize that these were the areas which were climate impacted, but rather that these were the most vulnerable communities with populations which needed to, be, to move sometimes several times a year. And we started, a, uh, started service delivery so that these migratory communities, every time they move, they would be empowered 
to lead a dignified life. So I started the first mobile ship hospitals, schools, and uh, of course, access to finance, and finally, the linkages with the government serving over today more than 6.5 million people every year with direct service delivery, with Bangladesh having 170 million people, we still have a long way to go. The, one of the things that I've really felt about this conference is, you know, that both nature-based solutions in both for nature-based solutions and for climate-based solutions, you have said, and we have heard over and over again, knowledge is key and learning is crucial. There is something more. It is that we have learned that if if you are not in, if you just do projects or just do trials and pilots, then it doesn't really work because the communities need to be empowered. And for that, dignity, bringing dignity to the community in whatever work you do is essential. And the stakeholders, I would say, need to have a lot more humility, all of us as stakeholders. You know, it's not the scientists, it's not the academicians, it's not the people with, who have fun, fundings and money. It's not us NGOs who are, or the, neither the policymakers or the youth activists, you know, who are alone going to make this change. We have heard over the last four days such incredible movements from all sectors. So everybody needs to be on board. And I think this is extremely important. And the way we work, we should not do anything which provokes wrong actions because that has a synergetic effect you know leading to leading to decision makers which are wrong or or involvement of governments which are not in the right way or people in the right way and for this i i have to mention that elena ostrom who was the peace prize winner of Econo uh, sorry the nobel prize winner for economics in 2009 had also observed this and also an observation of your team which is do no harm and this is also very important for us i think to absorb and take home thank, thank you very you. much runa for those excellent uh, uh, experiences that you got mm -hmm. from the conference i'm very glad that uh, you felt it was useful for you and, and your colleagues. I, I, I hope friendship will now be able to become one of the champions in, in climate change adaptation, as well as all the other good work that you've been doing as well. So and now, um, just to let you know, the panelists, you, you will, I will ask you to come back at the very end again to reflect a little bit about what happens next after we've heard about a bit more from the conference itself. Uh, so you'll get another bite of the cherry later. But let me give you a minute each of you uh, now to maybe just give a little bit of what your uh, major messages, one or two uh, or, or so, that you think are the big uh, takeaways from your perspective of uh, any particular session. It doesn't have to be uh, everything, uh, covering everything, but particular sessions that you felt that something came out that you felt was significant that you would like to uh, 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 maybe work on or take back to your colleagues and, and think about going, uh, doing some more work on that. And I'll go back to Claire first and then David and then Runa. Claire? Thanks, Salim. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm really um, enjoying my other panelists' comments as well. It's, um, uh, it's great to be part of this community. It's so rewarding. So, okay, my top messages. Um, well, we're going to hear the sort of distillation of the CBA messages more generally, but I guess the things that I'd highlight, one is around connecting. So we've we talked a lot over the last few days about vertical connection as well as horizontal connection, integrating the, the sort of national and international with the local, as well as broadly across stakeholders. And, and in CBA, we had that full range, as the LDC chair himself said, with the incoming COP presidency represented, the LDC group, the donors, MDBs, we had commissioners from GCA with Sheila and, and, um, and Musa, but there's been a huge range of different actors. And what we were talking a lot about was the need to engage these different actors very early in the process. The private sector needs to be involved in, in developing thinking that we, developing approaches we want them to invest in. We need to engage national governments and donors early in those processes. So they're part of the learning and that requires different ways of engaging them. But if we don't do that, they're not convinced by the evidence and they don't become part of co-producing the approaches. Um, we, we also heard about how um, at, at the local level, the poor are multitasking with a range, responding to a range of different shocks and challenges. And 
when we bring the local much more into our approaches, we're, we're beginning to develop more holistic approaches to the range of interlinked shocks and increasing synergies. So that's my first was around connecting. The other, the next was around changing incentives for giving agency. So we really have to, and this is, I suppose, what we've been doing in IID with the Money Where It Matters work that so many of you have already um, um, helped us develop. But we have to think through deliberately how we change incentives for the actors throughout the delivery chain. And in, so that they are incentivized to invest in the capabilities of these many distributed institutions. And some of the ideas that came out from that was around how do we increase the downward accountability. So, um, so the delivery actors are responsible for um, uh, how, the, how the local partners are engaged and how they see the benefits. Um, as well, and that requires changing how they're accountable to donors. So deliberate analysis is needed, um, it's sort of more top-down, bottom-up incentive setting. And um, one of the things I really enjoyed was the cartoon session on, on really thinking this through and some of the sort of visualization of the challenges that we're facing. I think using humor could be a really good way of us influencing in the coming year. Um, and then my final thought was on, um, it's actually one that came up from the CGRF team around celebrating courage. We need it to lean into risk if we're going to enable transformation. And we saw, you know, just from since last CBA, where we had the LDCs consulting with this community around their 2050 vision and huge progress being made on that, that we had the GCA consulting around the locally led action track. So we're beginning to get that sort of traction with our, with our partners. And really we need to sort of focus our efforts in the coming year to feed into a real change in how we tackle climate change. I offer COP26 team a real, um, a really clear proposition for how to do that. Great, Thanks. thank you very much, Claire. Some very, very good messages. David, some quick uh, reflections on takeaway messages for you. Um, my first is let's stop the blame game. And since COVID has brought us in an equal balance, Let's now start and move step by step, the power brokers, the people with the money, the grassroots, the youth, and everyone sing the same song. Let's act now. That's the only message I'll take home. The second one, how do we break the power dynamics in such a way that we have an equilibrium where we come on a round table and we give each other moments to reflect on the predicaments and looking at the solutions together with the resources that we have. Lastly, the digital technology has linked us together. How do you promote this so that we move forward in terms of connectivity, in terms of collaborations, in terms of even messaging, and in terms of informing each other when we have such issues? So CBA has taught me that connectivity in terms of digital technology, and now that we are moving to have the digital tools on climate information systems, could we make them uh, accustomed to the communities so that they can actually predict and give changes and monitor what happens Great. within our environments and climates? Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. Excellent. I, I think you know, you've touched on something that's extremely important, which is, and there's a very interesting debate going on or discussion going on in the chat box on whether we should make CBA an online event every year going forward. Um, I can tell you that the, the hosts for next year, CBA 15, are going to be here in Bangladesh, and it's going to be BRAC. And they are very much looking forward to people coming and visiting and seeing them. So let's see. <laughs> we don't want to go 100% online. We, if we can get people to come, we would like them to come. Uh, but we would, uh, I, I, at the same time, we don't want to lose the opportunity that being digital uh, enables a huge number of people from all over the world not to have to fly you know, it brings down our carbon footprint in a very big way. So let's see, you know, think about that as we go forward. Uh, Runa, I'll give you the last word in this round and then we'll come back to all three of you at the end. Runa, take away messages. Sorry. So we started with Mr. Wandi, what he had said that despite the pandemic, climate change continues and we are seeing this. The way that Mrs. Rosemary Atiena brought down said that indigenous knowledge is the key factor. Sheila 
said, vulnerability is connected to all vulnerability today is connected to climate change. Mr. Musa, that unlocking, unlocking local capabilities. Actually, this is the theme on which we have worked. You know, these four messages are very strong and they have, you know, and they are the central theme for me. And the most important thing is that to now is a kind of a time to make a plea to decision makers to have more trust in actions which are going on in the field. Because you see, they are not, they, we, are, we have to stop pilot projects from happening. We don't need pilots anymore. We can, there are enough, there's enough work going on, enough actions being shown in the field, you know, for, for people to take action. For example, our mangrove, for the Friendship Mangrove Project. You know, this is, we are the largest player, you know, making uh, in the private sector replantation. So there are hundreds of things that thousands that we have seen examples going on and we want them to have more trust the institutions, the policymakers and funders to have more trust in us, those who are at the field. And this solidarity and trust, you know, is needed for scaling up. Friendship has been doing this. We have been linking this for years now, but it's needed. But now it needs to be scaled up and CBA is in the perfect position to be able to link us together. And, and this is what you're doing. And uh, perhaps for the GCA next year, you know, in January, and of course the COP, this needs to be central because what is available does not need to be reinvented. And to have more trust in those organizations which have shown impact at the field level to scale up and create changes. And I think this is something that I would like to bring forth, you know, for the next conferences also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Runa. And, and hopefully friendship will be able to play a big part <laughs> in that as we'll be hosting it here in Bangladesh next year. Great, so um, it's now, thank you all to our three uh, panelists. We will be coming back to you, so please uh, stay with us. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, Susan Nandudu, who is uh, from Uganda, and she has been leading the, uh, the climate finance track of the uh, CBA conference, but she's going to give us an overview of the outcomes from all five sessions. And then following that, we will have a Mentimeter uh, a discussion where we get inputs from everybody who's online with us now. And then we will uh, come back again and do a bit of reflection uh, after we've all heard the outputs from the conference. So Susan, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much for the invitation, um, the introduction. I want to thank IIED for allowing me uh, the opportunity to lead in the climate finance. My role here is a challenging one which is to present to you the key messages after all the hard work in the last four days. Um, and I pray that I will do justice to all the themes um, in the messages that will be shared here below. Next time, please. Good, so um, I'll speak now to the messages from the nature-based solutions. Um, we had several and we've chosen to keep the top three and here in the nature-based solutions the first is that we need integrated approaches to adaptation including nature-based solutions that address key interlinked social challenges societal challenges including climate change and biodiversity loss and build holistic resilience to future and unanticipated global challenges. The key point there is integrated approaches and it's not enough to think and plan in one way, uh, but integration, integration, integration. Secondly, social capital and collective actions are critical to building resilience for those interlinked societal challenges. Although it takes time to build, we have learned that within the communities, there is a lot of social capital that needs to be acknowledged and recognized a lot more. So um, governments, donors, and development partners need to provide long-term finance. I underscore that, to provide long-term finance and 
support to build strong local based collective organizations. The previous speakers have spoken to this, but we need that to mobilize support and scale up nature based solutions for adaptation at scale and in the long term. These ketones have kept coming over and over through this last three, three days. The third is that indigenous people, women, local communities, they are already championing nature-based solutions and they hold valuable traditional knowledge that we need to build on. They are we, we need to build on their decades of experience of implementing those integrated solutions. We have listened to lots of examples and it is now upon us to recognize this capacity and move forward with it. So this traditional knowledge needs to be linked with science. It's, it's no longer enough to, to just talk about indigenous knowledge, indigenous, indigenous knowledge. We need to take um, that into linkage with science and support it with enabling policies. The adaptation uh, technology theme spoke to um, issues of scale up and how to attract financing uh, using adaptation technologies. And one of the core messages that we are taking home is that we need to build the evidence base in order to attract financing, in order to attract private sector to invest in building adaptation technologies. And what do we need to build this evidence base? Some of the things that was, were spoken to include having a clear social economic case that, and presenting and using human stories. The stories are many, they are just not being articulated enough. Private sector, for example, does not um, consider some of the adaptation technologies viable enough for uh, business. So it is our responsibility as a community to um, use human stories to make the evidence base more solid. Um, the other is a financial case or speaking to business models for smallholders and, and, and investors to, 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 to make investments. Uh, it came out quite strongly that in part of building the evidence base, we, we need, although we have been mostly um, non-governmental civil society, we need to consider conducting market analysis to understand who our markets are, uh, who uh, the, the target um, market is for the adaptation technologies and that they should speak to the needs of the people. Secondly, uh, adaptation technologies theme came up with that governments need to get incentives right. I'll say that again. Governments need to get incentives right to create an enabling environment for investment in and uptake of adaptation technologies by communities. For example, solar powered irrigation. <coughs> um, uh, we spoke to, we had examples from mobile technologies and uh, several uh, technologies that are mobile app, del um, delivered through mobile apps. They need a conducive environment. It might take a shape of uh, ta taxation. It, it might take a, a completely different um, approach but we need to look into incentivizing and having an environment that encourages adaptation technologies to be um, invested in so that local enterprises can deliver the hardware services and help build adaptive capacity. Very, very critical, this came up and uh, I would also like to add my voice to thank the young people for speaking this loudly, that young people can be drivers of new technology and be knowledge brokers. This is especially so the case, it's, uh, it has been made more valid or visible through this COVID-19 context, 
which has created opportunities for digital solutions such as online marketing to, to be spread out faster um, across, across the globe and the engagement of young people in agriculture and uh, rural economies has also been largely enabled through these technologies. So the responsive policy uh, spoke to the issue of building trust. I don't know, I don't want to be so fast on that one, but yes, building trust amongst the community that when community members are given opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge in practice as organized and empowered agents of change that draw linkages to responses, to resources such as information, finance, decision-making power, um, uh, the, the importance of building trust within the communities was really underscored that uh, external players, governments, uh, donors, private sector need to trust the communities more. Secondly, we spoke to the INGOs and multilaterals. They have a huge opportunity called convening power. Can we use that space to open doors to enable local actors to have a sit at the table, the decision-making table, so that they share experiences, so that they can help aggregate voices and also expose decision makers to local realities. Finally, policy needs to recognize the multidimensional nature of risk. We have uh, experienced COVID everywhere and the multitasking required to manage the many different hazards. In climate finance, oh God. So we spoke largely to the need for longer term investment that has been said over and over. I'll not speak so much to it, uh, but to emphasize that um, information needs to flow to um, the communities and build their capacities, including the institutions at the community level to create better financial mechanisms. We need financing at the local level and all this capacity is required. Secondly, they need to take a more deliberate approach to shaping incentives for different actors along the value chain of climate finance delivery. In particular, policy and subsidy combinations create positive loops of added benefits and enhanced participation. They need to be considered. And finally, funders, they must begin to see success beyond concrete results and outputs. So um, can we encourage and recognize learning and especially learning from failure so that we do not repeat mistakes that um, other financial resources have helped us uh, experience. Um, so consequently, more flexible funding arrangements are essential to operationalize this. Next, please. The youth inclusion theme, oh, I love it. It has come out with strong messages that we need a clearer path towards youth inclusion in policy advocacy. And the youth are telling us that at events like this one, international events uh, like the Conference of Parties, uh, part youths are usually invited, the same people are invited, but they are telling us that there is a lot more diversity among the youth that needs to be considered. There are youth in, in informal businesses, there are youth across various countries that need to be brought on table and be part of especially um, these high level forums. Secondly, they know that the scientific evidence is good for policy development. Um, but scientific evidence needs to look past science and become more inclusive to be understood by the layman. And speaking to um, they as young people, they need capacity to understand climate change better, to communicate it better, and uh, to be able to use their energy and resources to articulate the science better. Sadly, um, is when the capacity development is done, there is need to be, to, to, to follow up. They are talking about um, st taking stock 
of what has been implemented? Where are the gaps? What, what can we as the leaders in decision-making spaces um, commit to? And when we do commit, they want to come back and say, uh, you committed last year to this issue. We'd like to, to, to know how much you have implemented under that commitment. So capacity in that area is equally important, but very, very importantly, the young people are telling us that while they need the capacity and while we are inviting them to spaces like this one to, to engage, many are doing so in a voluntary basis. They are invited as volunteers. They are saying they have the right to earn for the work, for the time, and for the innovation that they invest in. Um, so we need to, to, to look into ensuring pay for the young people. On gender, the conversation in this conference has revealed that as a community, we, we are not capturing gender enough. We need to do a lot more. Um, it's, uh, it was revealed that the high level conversations such as climate finance didn't speak uh, in concrete terms around issues of gender. So as a community, we still have a lot of work. And when we, you have this, the issue of gender articulated, sometimes it is skewed more to the women, but we, sh we know that gender is more than men and women. On the issue of monitoring, evaluation, and learning, we have learned that male can be a transformational and participatory tool if it uses shared and peer learning. We need to integrate this more. And we must be, uh, male must be long-term, just like climate finance. We need to consider it in the long-term and we must explore how well we can integrate this. And finally, the next slide. We, uh, on the rural and urban perspective, um, very critical information coming out that the urban perspective is not well articulated, but going forward, there is need for scaling up of the distributed innovation and COVID-19 has shown us a lot of innovation in the urban areas, but we need to scale up these um, uh, projects that are scattered and keep the momentum. Secondly, uh, is on disruptive resilience. There is huge potential if we recognize informality. There's a lot of informality within the urban areas. There's local innovation going on and we need to harness that to ensure the unique properties of the urban areas are integrated over time. And finally, as I'll speak to the last, which is we must establish structured networks with knowledge, um, knowledge brokers such as universities and centers of excellence, plus the administrative uh, uh, of the local governments or the urban governments, so that they can play a, a linkage role and the brokering role that supports um, urban resilience, knowing that in, in urban centers, people are always moving, but if we have platforms um, that are dynamic and they bring all this value, then that can remain uh, for a longer term. That's the permanence that will remain and keep rolling forward as people change in the urban areas. Yes. That, that is the last so word. Much. Thank you. Apologies that I, I had to do it so fast, but thank you so much. So we're going to go now to a quick Mentimeter to try and gauge the priorities of everyone who's joined this call today. So the code for the presentation is 96475969. And if you go to menti.com, www.menti.com and enter that code, you should find it. So the first one asks you to describe your experience at CBA 14. These are coming in quickly now, insightful, coming out strong.
more and more coming in quickly now. Insightful. Engaging. Awesome. I like that one. Interactive. Inspirational. Excellent. It's really great to see uh, that CBA uh, is generating all of these uh, very positive words and uh, the same sorts of words that we uh, uh, like to hear in the in-person conference as well. And it's great that we've been able to create that kind of experience. So we'll just give it another 15 seconds and then we'll move quickly onto the next ones, which will ask you to engage a bit more closely with some of the priorities. Now we are short on time, so we'll go through them quite quickly, but the presentation does remain. So um, you can carry on doing it even whilst we're not presenting it. And you should still be able to share your perspectives and priorities. And the priorities that we take from that, we will feed into the key messages that we report from the conference. So Matt, if you want to go on to the next slide. And Susan, do you want to perhaps read out what these options are? Okay, so we'd like to explore which of these do, which of these do we need to communicate urgently? And one is funders must consider longer term investment to build sustainable institutions and capacities. The second is we must change the incentives so that funders can funders see learning as an element of success. The third is to build the capacities of young people so they can lead and innovate and pay them for their time. The last is COVID-19 is an opportunity to change the way we deliver finance and resilience building. I like what I see, you're already addressing them, yeah. Great, a good level of endorsement for some of these messages, I think. Yes. This one at the, the top funders. Being to the funders. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another 10 seconds on that one. You should still be able to continue to vote even if we've moved on. So don't, don't worry if you can't do that. Okay, on to the next one, Matt. Okay, it's, it's the same for this one. Um, yeah, let's go for it. Which of these do we need to communicate urgently? That we must consider multidimensional resilience in the way we understand local risks and mail. No, let me let you process it since you're already calling. Go ahead. And if you can't join Mentimeter or you're struggling with it, do feel free to share your comments in the chat box as well. Some really strong endorsement here, but particularly for indigenous people uh, being able to champion, recognizing that they're already championing their own solutions and being supported by science and policy. Excellent. Okay, the next one, Matt. And the third and final one now. Which of these do we need to communicate more urgently? INGOs and multilaterals must use their convening power. Someone's gone straight in with 10 out of 10 for those top two. Building equitable partnerships. Youth inclusion needs to get beyond tokenism in young people uh, because they're not currently diversely represented. Building trust. Uh, trust is built when communities are given the opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge in practice as organized and empowered agents of change or that more work is needed to recognize how male can be participatory and develop indicators that reflect the multi-dimensional nature of climate and risks so strong endorsement for all of these so far which is really positive particularly for uh, trusting in communities who have already demonstrated their knowledge and, and, and building that trust through practice 
trusting them as organized and empowered agents of change. Great, okay. Now the last slide will ask you to share uh, comments for the future. So Matt, next slide, please. Now some of them are already coming in, ensuring communities are leading the fight, amplifying voices of those who haven't been heard, creating local ownership, Excellent. So please do keep submitting those. And thank you so much for uh, helping us with that prioritization. And, and it's great to see that the messages are widely endorsed by the community. Um, I think we'll hand back now to Salim. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sam and, and Susan, for an excellent uh, uh, run through, even though it was uh, a little bit rushed. I think it was quite rich. So thank you very much. So at this point in time, we're very uh, fortunate to have with us a special guest who's Mr. Paul Arkwright, who is the UK government's COP26 regional ambassador to Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is a role which involves building international engagement in the lead up to COP26 climate conference next November. He previously worked as the British High Commissioner to Nigeria and has served in many other international roles. Uh, so, Paul, you have the floor to just share some of your uh, reflections on what you heard. And in particular, if you wouldn't mind giving us some advice on how you see these might uh, be brought into the COP26 agenda, particularly the adaptation and resilience track of uh, COP26. Paul? Yeah, thanks very much, Salim. Um, just checking that you can hear me as this is the yes, first time. Go ahead. You're fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, well, I, I've only just joined the last hour or so, and, and, and it's clearly been an excellent conference, and, and many congratulations to the organisers. Um, wh what I particularly like about it is that you're making very clear recommendations, which are actionable. Um, and so um, uh, we will obviously gather all this evidence, we'll work with, with Claire and the team, um, and feed it into uh, our preparations for COP26. Um, I do think that community-based action um, is something which, and by the way, not just in climate change, but, but elsewhere, I saw it in operation uh, in northern Nigeria, for example. Um, community-based action is, is a fundamental part of the solution. Um, and especially in somewhere like Africa, which is uh, basically not responsible for, for emissions, um, how uh, they, we, we can tap into community-based um, actors in order to find solutions for the world and not just for Africa. So um, really important discussion and thank you very much. Um, on, on, and I picked up on some of those uh, themes uh, as, as we were going through. Um, finance and long-term finance, one of them, absolutely. So I think in the past, far too much uh, international uh, climate funding and finance has gone to mitigation. I think the, the amount at the moment is something like 90 or the proportion is 90% uh, going to mitigation uh, and the rest to adaptation. Um, we really need to, to shift that. We need to move it much more towards uh, a 50-50 split. Um, and that was one of the reasons why the UK, together with Egypt, was pushing this uh, call for action at the UN Climate Action Summit last year. Um, we've got 118 countries signed up, 80 organizations signed up for that. Um, there are some very practical and tangible uh, results which we're hoping to achieve from that. Um, and one of those is around uh, financing and access to finance. So this is a really important uh, angle. Um, we need to move beyond the $100 billion a year goal. Um, uh, we're not there yet, uh, and yet we need to go beyond it um, and mobilize and galvanize not just donors, but uh, multilateral development banks and crucially the private sector. Uh, in order to uh, reach and indeed surpass that target. So building on the call for action at the Climate Action Summit, um, improving response and pr preparedness um, to climate related disasters. So we're, we're very actively involved. We've, we've provided quite a lot of funds to REAP. Some of you will, I'm sure you've talked about REAP, Risk Informed Early Action Partnership. Um, really important global network, which is again looking at uh, practical uh, assistance when it comes to disaster preparedness. So, you know, how can we improve 
um, warning systems? How can we improve uh, meteorological uh, forecasts? How can we use the digital digital technology, which um, I know has been a, a key part of adaptation technology that you've been talking about? How can we build capacity locally to act in advance of um, uh, climate disasters and climate shocks um, so that we can minimise loss and damage from, from those? So again, that's an important angle to what we're trying to achieve through uh, our efforts as COP president. Um, encouraging parties in the run-up to produce um, ambitious adaptation plans. So this is part of what we call the ambition uh, agenda. So it's around, yeah, it's, it's around NDCs, obviously, and long-term strategies where we want to see and we're encouraging adaptation to be a key part of those national plans. Um, so national action plans bringing in innovative technologies um, to help with um, uh, implementation uh, and seeing how the donor community, when it comes to LDCs, how the donor community can provide the right kind of investments uh, for that, um, those uh, adaptation technologies. Um, building support for um, LDC-led initiatives and LDC-owned initiatives. Again, and this goes a bit, a bit to that inclusion and diversity piece, it's around um, ensuring that LDC voices are heard as part of the process. Um, and that's very much part of my role as the Africa Regional Ambassador so that um, I am providing a, a listening ear um, as well as a, a sort of channel of communication so that these kind of messages we can feed back to our ministers, to Adok Sharma, who's the COP president, as you know, uh, and indeed to, to senior colleagues in the teams who are working on the negotiations track, the ambitions track, uh, and the five campaigns that we have, I won't go into all the detail of those, but they do match very much the, the themes which you have been discussing over the past few days. One of those is nature and nature-based solutions. Um, nature um, is uh, very much at the front line of climate change um, and uh, is affected more than pretty much any other sector, but is also one of those sectors which can provide answers. So we're looking at sustainable land use, at forestry, um, at ways in which we can help in, in, in countries which have been devastated by climate change, um, and where there's a nature-based solution uh, on at hand. Uh, and I know you've heard the um, video from Lord Goldsmith, who's a particular advocate of nature-based solutions uh, and the importance of biodiversity, and ensuring that biodiversity is not seen as a separate track to climate change, but very much part of that holistic approach that we need to take in order to tackle those challenges. Um, and finally, um, it was good to hear, and I'm not surprised, that the, um, the emphasis on youth. Um, I spoke two days ago to uh, a youth activist group in Africa called the Resilient 40, um, which, like this group, has come up with lots of innovative and interesting ideas. Um, but very similar themes have come through. You know, we want our voice to be heard. We're part of the solution. Um, we are, um, you, you need to take responsibility for ensuring that our generation doesn't suffer in the same way. Um, so those are voices which are important. Um, and we are working on how we can ensure that the COP, the event itself in Glasgow next year, is inclusive, is diverse, um, and, and doesn't just give youth a voice as a kind of side event or something which is, uh, I think tokenistic was a word that was used. Um, so how can we engage youth with the policy makers, with the leaders who are going to be there? Um, uh, and how can we give them a voice, um, not just sort of shouting from the sidelines, but actually um, a seat at the table? Um, and it's not just about youth, it's about women, it's about indigenous people, very important uh, in this context as well. It's about people with disabilities. Um, so we have a whole team in the COP unit who are looking at that sort of inclusion agenda. Um, there'll be more on that to come. Um, before anybody raises it, visas I know is a massive issue and we are um, talking to our home office about visas, as you would expect, uh, Salim. Um, we don't know yet, obviously it's a bit too early. Um, to say the degree to which this will be a physical COP or uh, a virtual COP in much the same way you're talking about 
CBA 15 and, mm -hmm. and how that's going to look. And hopefully it will be in Bangladesh and you will have visitors spending money in Bangladesh, which would be excellent for the economy, uh, as well as um, uh, there, there are pluses and minuses when it comes to the climate side of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly it's our intention to hold a physical COP. And there are certain things like negotiations and, and those kind of crucial meetings which happen in the margins uh, and, 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 and which help people build the necessary networks, which, are, which we, want to, we don't want to lose. Uh, but much will depend on the on the track and the future of of, of COVID as we as we go forward. Yeah. Um, so those are those are some of the um, thoughts that have come out of this, um, uh, or my responses at least to to some of those key messages which have come across. Please do ensure that the COP unit gets those. Um, uh, 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 can I add my voice to those who who thank Susan for a brilliant job in. Uh, uh, identifying and presenting those messages, um, feed them in, uh, and I will ensure, along with my colleagues, that they are um, taken taken into account, taken to heart, and be part of our own implementation and action plan, uh, and not just a sort of nice to have on the sidelines. Thanks very much for the invitation, and uh, I've enjoyed the short period that I've been with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. We really appreciate your uh, spending the time with us and sharing your thoughts. Just a cup couple of very quick points uh, that you on what you mentioned. On the youth uh, issue, which we've all recognized as being very important, it's interesting that today happens to be the day of action of the Fridays for Future. And they're having events all over the world. You know, the last, it's now evening Dhaka time. And in Bangladesh, we've had a whole series of events all around the country by young people. And the theme for this today's day of action is most affected people and areas which is very relevant for yeah. the community-based adaptation work that we are doing. The other uh, a point I'd like to just highlight for you is that the nexus between nature-based solutions and adaptation and resilience, which are two sort of parallel tracks in the COP26, actually come together very much at the community level. Many of the communities that are doing adaptation are also very dependent on nature and on ecosystems. And nature-based solutions of adaptation or eco ecosystem-based adaptation is a very, very cross-cutting issue at that particular level. And, and the two themes come together very closely, something to think about as we uh, go forward. But thank you very much, Paul, for, for being with us today and, and sharing your thoughts. So we are now sort of uh, running a little bit out of time, a little behind schedule. Uh, so I'd like to come back to our three panelists and I'll go in reverse order this time. Uh, invite Runa first and then David and then finally Claire, if you can be uh, brief. And the question for each of you now is what are you going to do tomorrow or day after tomorrow uh, after the conference is over and you go back to your work? Is there something that you think you can take back into your day job as it is, uh, as it were? Uh, in the work that you're going to do going forward. Uh, Runa, would you like to start? Thank you. Well, I would actually put the question in a different way. How are you all and the world going to take what we are already doing? <laughs> Good question. You know, <laughs> because we, and I, I, can, I think I can speak on behalf of many, you know, so many people, so organizations who have been present with you throughout the conference, we have been giving real solutions with work, you know, with our work over years. And we need your help and people like, of course, Mr. Paul, <laughs> who's just spoken, to be voices. And not only to be voices, to act. Act in taking us forward, you know. And because it's only together that we can... We are, we are speaking so much on, on what to do but solutions are there. Of course, you need, you need the whole, whole uh, platform of stakeholders, you know, but uh, I think uh, uh, we, are, we are not going to, the, those who are suffering today will not stop suffering tomorrow, <laughs> you know, just because there is hope in the future. So I think there, that is something that we need to have compassion, empathy, you know, for those. And I think that the voices that you, the way that uh, you have through CBA, uh, that's, uh, that CBA has with IID and all of you together, 
what you have been doing for bringing these voices up to the level over the years, you know, from mitigation solution of 90% being funded, you know, to, to, I think, now becoming a strong voice, this needs to be carried forward. And I think every action that we do, will, we, will, we will have to do this together. And uh, we hope for more linkage, more solidarity between the different stake, stakeholders and players. And that is the actions that we will take. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Roman. Uh, David, would you like to just share some reflections on what you think you can uh, take back with you? Yes, my reflection is um, I emphasize or reiterate what uh, Paul just said, that community-based action is quite fundamental. And there's open doors for grassroots communities for local communities, for indigenous people, to ensure that they, they claim their space. Could their voices be the voice of reason for the globe so that everything changes now instead of remaining on the realm of 1% few making 50% punished or get the repercussion of climate change impacts. So for me, is to go with the social movement, continue to pursue policymakers, influence the grassroots, create linkages between government, between donors, and between the grassroots themselves, and solidify those efforts so that we have a unison way of looking at the framework of climate change adaptation. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and finally, Claire, uh, what's IID going to be doing on Monday morning? See, with an invitation uh, that Paul uh, just offered us to, sh to feed the messages into the COP team, that will be our... <laughs> Excellent. We've been working Excellent. very hard to make sure that that happens and really appreciate the effort by the COP26 team with Paul joining, but also hearing from Zach. Um, and I guess th there is a big opportunity for this community to keep influencing COP26 and keep building support and buy-in to the locally-led climate action that we've been discussing here, because we're beginning to see that real commitment to locally led action. The second thing is, I guess we've still to really find what the burning boat is that will change incentives to create the sort of disruptive partnerships we've been talking about. Um, yesterday, um, in between CBA 14 sessions, I joined the LDC's UNGER event, uh, the, the wonders of online uh, um, uh, you can jump from one conference to another. And there, Ashok Sharma, as the UK pop president designate, um, was promising to champion locally led climate action and the LDC's Life AR initiative, which is fabulous to hear. What we need to do is build and, and, and broaden that partnership. So hopefully working very closely with yourself, Salim, with the Bangladesh um, uh, interest in in promoting locally led action you know how can we begin to build that out into a much broader coalition um, so I guess the third thing is um, it's not just a job of IID it's up to us all to feed our messages into the events between and into events into different processes that we have access to so we've got we've potentially got a DNC days uh, this year that would be held under the understanding risk forum um, well, as soon as we've got that confirmed, we'll share that. It'll be coming the end of November, early December at some point. We'll have about 20, um, about a day's worth of session within somebody else's um, event. Um, we've also got the Biodiversity Summit. We've got Gobishona next year. We've got next year's CPA. Um, we've got the Dutch Climate Adaptation Summit. These are all moments and processes that we can all, as long as we're all working collectively, we could really implement. So that, that is my request is that, you know, this isn't about what IID does, it's about what we do as a community. Um, oh, and I should mention that for those of you that, um, that haven't registered yet, the post after this session, there's, um, the, there's a meeting between the civil society and the UK COP team, advancing the climate adaptation and resilience agenda, keeping up momentum. And I think the, the link of how to share that has been shared by the CBA organizers in, through the usual email. Thanks, Celine. Great, thank you very much, Claire. That's a big agenda and, and uh, <laughs> we wish you luck. Uh, and obviously we'll be working together on this. So not just you, it's you and us <laughs> uh, taking that forward. Um, so let's all, all give a hand to our, our panelists and our, our uh, chief guest, uh, Paul Arkwright, uh, for excellent interventions. I think we, we're getting good momentum and positive uh, feedback uh, for how we can take things forward. We have a few more items to do and we are running a little bit out of time, so we might have to go 
over time by a little bit. I hope people can stay on. Uh, I'm now going to invite Jan Willem, who is going to tell us who won the Dragon's Den uh, initiative. So Jan, would you like to uh, take the floor and tell us what happened? Yes, thank you very much. We had a very energetic, inspiring uh, day of action yesterday with eight uh, project holders presenting their idea in five minutes. Uh, they had short uh, uh, preparation time, but it was uh, very strong, very strong candidates. It was difficult for the dragons, the four dragons that we had to, uh, to choose the winner. But I will now announce the winner. And I would ask uh, this picture to come forward and present to us in one minute her, it's a she. Most of the pictures were uh, women, young women. Um, I would like to ask Inesa Grace from Rwanda to come forward and present her project, Rural Community in their Sustainable Economic Development. Inesa Grace is CEO and founder of The Green Fighter and she won the Dragon's Den of this year. Inesa, congratulations. You were a very strong uh, candidate. Of course, it was, as always, difficult to choose for the Dragons, but you stood out with your project and with your presentation. So please, in one minute, could you tell us what your idea is about? Uh, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this, uh, this great news. I was, I was not expecting this. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So uh, the project is uh, called uh, Rural Community in the Sustainable Economic Development. Uh, the project is aiming to conserve uh, a natural forest located in one of the rural sectors in Rwanda, in Kibilizi. We will do this through uh, empowering local youth to form a cooperative and to be able to sell natural honey to the local market. But in addition to this, we will also create a community-based fund for women and girls to have access on finance on, finance on how to, uh, to, go, to invest in small, their small business, such as agriculture, sewing, uh, and other activity. Uh, what, we need, what we need is for like the Pilot for 12 months is a grant of five uh, five hundred five thousand pounds to train in conservation and also to initiate the cooperative for 50 youth, but also to install 300 beehives in the forest and use a software to to manage the cooperative uh, benefits and also the fund. We will sell honey where one kilogram will be sold 26 pound and one beehive can produce up to 10 kilogram of honey. We have a team of four youth um, from different backgrounds, rural and urban, and we have a educational background, environmental engineering, environmental policy, leadership, and business administration and photography. Thank you so much. Thank you. As you can hear, you did it exactly in one minute. Very well done. And we now also announce the audience vote because we have a second winner. The audience vote went for Juliet Grace from Uganda. Juliet, congratulations. Your project inspired us and we would also like to ask you to pitch your idea in one minute. Well, I'm, I'm still in shock. <laughs> That's why, uh, anyways, uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Juliet Grace, I'm from Uganda. So the project that I teach, the project that we are working on is basically how we are involving young people to communicate about climate action and it's the climate action media van. What we are doing is promoting climate action and awareness through experimental journalism, media conservation, tourism and community service with support of technology. So the project basically what will be is just imagine young people in a bus moving around and moderating conversations on climate action. These conversations are led by young people for the young people and they're the ones taking action in all of this. Okay. Was that it? That's half a minute. That's even more impressive, Juliet. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Very quickly, I would like to uh, uh, thank the dragons, the four dragons, for their excellent um, uh, uh, responses and questions. And uh, of course, uh, thanks to all the pitchers for their very inspiring ideas. I would like to encourage the audience in this room to reach out, uh, watch the, the video of the Dragons Den. And if there's a project that you find interesting in any way, because you want to give advice or you know potential resources in terms of knowledge, that was the one minute sign, uh, uh, do connect to the pitchers themselves. Their email addresses are on the, on the presentation that's also online. So thank you very much, everyone. And once more, congratulations to Juliet and Inesa. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jan Willem, for that. And, and particularly, congratulations to Inesa and Juliet. And Inesa, you have another prize. You will be able to close out the conference in a few minutes. But before I give you the floor, I'm going to have one more speaker uh, share his thoughts. And that's uh, uh, Andrew Norton, who is the director of IID, who is uh, is the head of the team that pulled off the CBA 14 conference so well. So Andy, congratulations to all your colleagues and well done. Uh, would you like to share some final thoughts before we close? Huge thanks, Salim, and really huge thanks to everyone. Um, yeah, it's been amazing to see how vibrant this year's event has been and really exciting actually to see the possibilities that a virtual event has opened up. 70 countries and all the fantastic conclusions that Susan summarized so ably for us. Um, I'd just like to say a very few words to emphasize how influential CBA is now becoming on a global scale. The Talanoa Dialogue on Effective Adaptation at CBA 13 had a big impact on a range of really important developments since. Things like the Least Developed Countries 2050 Vision um, launched at the Climate Action Summit, the Secretary General Summit in New York in September of 2019. And building on that, the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, there was a, a compact which was signed between the LDCs and eight bilateral donors at COP25 in Madrid, which showed how we're starting to see key ideas such as um, money where it matters, respect for whole of society leadership, and the importance of long-term patient engagement. These things which are critical for effective and successful action. Um, we're starting to see these getting embedded into um, mainstream thinking on climate finance. CBOs played a massive role in all of that and also had an influence on the development of the um, Global Commission on Adaptation Local Action Track particularly the principles for locally led action, which I hope everyone would um, have a look at if they haven't already. Um, going forward, Claire's already mentioned how we want to take the lessons of this CBA forward to a range of events in 2021, including the Biodiversity Summit, uh, the Global Summit on Adaptation being organized by the Netherlands in January, and of course, COP26. And with reference to that, it was brilliant to have Paul Arkwright here showing COP team engagement with the event and the enthusiasm of the COP presidency team to take the lessons of this CBI forward into COP26. So now, before handing over to Inesa for closing, it's important to have some words of thanks for all those who've helped to make CBI 14 such a fantastic success. Um, and first thanks go to our overall primary host, the government of Bhutan, and again, the LDC chair from Bhutan has provided fantastic thoughts, I think, of both the opening session and the closing session of CBA. Also, huge thanks to our core funders, Irish Aid and the Climate Justice and Resilience Foundation. Um, obviously, without their support, this wouldn't have been possible. So massive thanks to them. I'd also like to pay a bit of a tribute to the excellent partnership with other organizations that have engaged in making it a success and critically have sponsored people to attend who might not have been able to participate otherwise. Uh, and that's Care International, Practical Action, the Global Resilience Partnership and the Global Commission on Adaptation. Huge thanks to them. But most importantly, um, I'd like to give special thanks to the seven contributing partners who've made this such a special event 
by bringing grassroots experience to the forefront in CBA 14. And that's uh, Slum Shack Dwellers International, SDI, the Waru Commission, Green Africa Youth, ActAid, BRAC International, the Boise Facility, and IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So huge thanks to them for incredible leadership and giving us such an, a rich range of grassroots experience to draw on. But finally, I can't let this go, Celine, without huge thanks to our special partners in the International Centre for Climate Change and Development based in Dakar, led by yourself. And of course, Salim, it was you who many years ago kicked off this whole series of CBA with the first CBA conference when you were with us at IAED. And it's important also to say this um, evolving global partnership of LDC universities taking forward climate change action um, it, the luck is also hugely important and brings great richness to every event like this. So just finally, a massive thanks to my IAED colleagues, if you will permit me, who've worked so hard to make this happen, to Claire for her leadership, but perhaps particularly, well, to many, but to Sam Green and Teresa Sarok, who've been the backbone of this enormous effort bringing this forward but to many others too in our climate and comms group. And finally, my thanks to everyone really, to all the participants. It's been a really special event and um, huge thanks to everyone, huge applause for everyone. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, we, we will be closing soon, but there are a couple of items left uh, before we finish. And at the very end, we are going to be sharing the video uh, that won the prize. So if those of you who are interested in the video, uh, please stay on for that and Ineza will be the closing. But before I hand over to Ineza for closing remarks, I just want to share a little bit of my own uh, sort of next steps as it were. All of these have been mentioned already, but I'll, I'll just take us over the next few weeks, months uh, leading up to COP26 at the end of next year. So in early Jan, in the in this third part of January, from the 21st to the 24th, uh, we will be hosting in Bangladesh, in my center, uh, the seventh annual Gobeshana Conference, the theme of which is going to be on locally led adaptation. And so we welcome and invite everybody. It'll be an online conference like the CBA 14. So everybody who was in CBA 14 is most welcome to join. The slide on the, uh, uh, the uh, screen has the website, you can visit it. Gobeshana, by the way, is a Bangla word for research. Uh, that's what we call it. It's a platform of more than 50 universities and research institutions in Bangladesh working on climate change. And we have an annual conference, which from next year, we are going to make it into a global conference. And then immediately after the Gobeshana conference on the 25th of January, there's going to be a global adaptation summit, which has already been mentioned several times, officially hosted by the government of the Netherlands. It was originally supposed to be a one day event in the Netherlands, but in October this year, but instead of, because of COVID-19, instead of being in October, it's been moved to the 25th of January and is no longer just one event in the Netherlands. There will be a high level event in the Netherlands, but there will also be a series of what are called anchor events across the globe over 24 hours on the 25th of January. One of which will be here in Dhaka in Bangladesh hosted by the government of Bangladesh, uh, the prime minister of Bangladesh herself, and that the focus of that will be locally led adaptation, which is where the community-based adaptation community of practice come in. So we hope you will all be able to participate in that. It will also be a virtual event as well. And then later in the year, we've already had a discussion about uh, CBA 15, uh, which will be hosted by BRAC in Bangladesh. Uh, I advise BRAC on their climate change work, and I can tell you that they're very keen to have people come and visit them and, and spend some time with them. So I think we, we uh, and we also recognize the, the op opportunities that being an online event uh, allows bringing in people from all over the world who can't fly into Bangladesh. So we might think of it making it into a hybrid event. Those of you who can come, can come. Those of you who can't come uh, can join us online. So we'll give some thought to that. And then as we heard, uh, COP26 at the end of the year, we hope to be able to give some significant inputs into the decision making that takes place in COP26, particularly on the adaptation track and also on the nature-based solutions track. Um, so I'm going to uh, end there by thanking 
everybody who participated in this session uh, and hand over to Ineza for some concluding remarks. And then after that, please stick around to see the video that won the uh, competition for videos. Ineza, please. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm still on the shock. Uh, okay. <laughs> So I say my name is Ineza Umoza Grace. Um, I am a global citizen and an eco-feminist. I believe in sustainability, the sustainability of the ecosystem and the power of you, anyone to lead with a special focus on women because they have been uh, the most vulnerable group for ages. CBA 14 had a team for, from local solution to global action. Let's remember that we were here with the purpose to know how we can increase adaptation to climate change for our vulnerable exposed community. This event was, was, was an event that bring hope, that brought hope to the achievement of the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable, the sustainable Development Goal, and other related, other related uh, convention decision as we understand their interlinkage. This is my first time to participate in the CBA uh, and with the momentum of youth inclusion that I, I experienced, I believe that the SBF 15 we will have more youth participation from all backgrounds, from the global north, global south, from the urban and rural background, who will share concrete results of what is, what is their contribution to the climate adaptation in their own unique perspective. For, from climate finance, adaptation, technology, responsive policy, natural-based answer. We need youth voice reflected in all manner in order to promote on ground activity. I humbly thank all of us who were present online, who managed to be connected through a computer screen, a telephone or a tablet, regardless of our time zone. It was really amazing to, to keep in mind that we can still be connected even if it's not on physically connected, but we can be connected with the purpose that we have because we have a common goal, which is to have a sustainable environment for our next generation. Let's keep, let's keep the momentum, let's keep the spirit, and I believe that together we can achieve even more. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Ineza. And just to close us out, I'm going to announce two winners, and each of the winners wins a free ticket to next year's CBA. So the prize for the most active commenter on all of the community boards is Maple Mateo. Congratulations. You uh, commented on almost uh, every comment board. Uh, we didn't tell anybody about that prize. So I'm hoping that one is a nice surprise and we will be in touch with you uh, about how to take that forward. The winner of the uh, uh, film competition was the uh, Women's Climate Center International. I'll just start my video. Uh, the film, uh, uh, let me just find the details. It was a documentary on the Women's Climate Centers International in Uganda, a documentary that explains how Women's Climate Center International women-led climate centers concept shows early progress at the site at the flagship center in Tororo. It was made by Joshua Maturi. The cameraman was Fred Mugeni and Tashila did the music and it was submitted by Tracy Mann. So thank you very much for that. Congratulations. It's a really great uplifting film. And assuming that my screen share works this time, I am going to share it to play us out. So thank you very much uh, to everyone who's been involved. Women's Climate Centers was founded by a group of women from Kenya, Uganda, South Africa and United States who came together to set up a network of centers led by women that address climate change impacts. The idea grew out of a survey carried out among women in local communities in Kenya who expressed the need for a network of centers led by women. Women Climate Center is a consortium of women-led grassroots organizations that come together to develop low-cost indigenous solutions to climate change. So we come up with solutions in thematic areas. We are looking at four themes which really like integrate with feed into each other. For example, we have the smart technologies department and then we have leadership and advocacy. Then we have biointensive and food production, food security section and we have environmental conservation. 
Tororo District, found in the eastern part of Uganda, bordering Kenya, was selected as a first site for the center because of adverse effects of climate change in the area, supported by the level of community sensitization and engagement which has been developed over many years by RWCCI partner Constance Okolet, chairperson of the Osukuru United Women Network. We use indigenous trees and indigenous plants to restore the environment. So promoting our tree planting at household labor, but then demonstrating it at the center. If you want to see the different varieties of indigenous trees that you can plant at home that are resilient enough to climate change, at our climate center you'll find that. We want to change the community to be very green and we shouldn't have floods, we shouldn't have the full sunshine. Because when it comes to rain, it rains and you find houses broken down, our trees broken down. So if we have so many trees, we shall have to bring down the issue of climate change. Also promoting by intensive farming, commonly referred to as kitchen gardens, small gardens that are a high intense volume of variety of crops that can thrive throughout the year. Promotion of low-cost appropriate technologies to climate centers. Like if you go around the households of the people we work with, you'll see they have our locally made energy saving stoves. Like Lorena stoves, like these simple stoves which preserve, because you will not clearly rule out that no one is cutting a tree or using firewood. But at least instead of using five of them to cook beans, you can use two or one. Then we are also doing toilets, but specifically like environmental friendly toilets like Ecosan. And as a center, we have a biointensive section. And then we can use this manure back in the gardens to boost the agriculture section. We also promote livelihood and promote saving small-scale enterprises in ranges of like farming, small-scale businesses, but also are selling tree siblings. Women's Climate Center is unique and based on a flat organizational structure which is collaborative as part of the continued community consultation and collaboration. The team that we are joined with, they now help us to bring in the knowledge that we didn't have. And right now, the community is very happy and appreciative and they look forward for more trainings, more knowledge, more empowerment. In as far as we are called Women Climate Centers International, we still work with the men. It's called male involvement in climate change. Then we also work with the youth, so we promote youth livelihood also. We were taught some small savings. We started the project of poultry keeping. The poultry has benefited me in a way that I can be able to raise money for my children's requirements. We plant trees, we put in nursery bed. After it has germinated, we sell. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic affecting various activities globally, Women's Climate Centers has built the foundation of the office block at the center that has been raised at the site of the first women-led one-stop climate solution center. The center's eco-sand toilets has been completed. Clearing of the land is ongoing and several indigenous local trees have been planted. The plan of the center is a big one because it is going to be a training school. People coming from all over the world to come and do training here. Then we are going to have the hotels one side of the center. Most of the trees you are seeing around that are generated by most members of the network. They give in the form of a price. And they have gardens, they sell some of the things to the community. So I see uh, Cairo as a parish, as a sub-county, benefiting to improve the climate by planting trees. 
WCCI Future Plans focuses on centers being self-sufficient and being able to generate revenue. This is intended on reducing or eliminating international donor dependency. The technology is given to the community and they will understand and they will do it by themselves. Now the generation that will come, it will now be easier, easier, easier and easy. What we want is to take away climate talk from the big conferences, big titles, PhDs, and come to where the problem is actually and create a community of practice.